All righty. Here we go. Thank you so much. All right. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Oh, we, got a, we might have a mouthful. That's okay. So don't yell if you got a mouthful, but that's all right. All right. We are here to have some fun. We're going to have a little bit of higher energy right now, I think, because we're going to have some very, very fun storytelling. Not that food doesn't give us energy, but the way that I tell my stories is very interactive. So don't be surprised if you become part of the story. Okay, and I love to tell my stories in this way because it makes them a little bit more real to people. Now again, my name is Perry Ground, and I am a Turtle Clan member of the Onondaga Nation. If you haven't already learned today or at any point in time, the Onondagas are one of the original five nations that lived across upstate New York, not in this area where the Lenapes and other native peoples live, although we came here to trade and gather and meet with them all the time, but our tribes lived across upstate New York from about where Albany is all the way over to about where Rochester, New York is right now, the Hudson River to the Genesee River. We lived all across there. There are other tribes that lived in other parts of New York around us, but those original five tribes included the Mohawk people, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, where I come from, the Cayuga, and the Seneca, which is where my dad comes from. And a long time ago, those five tribes were constantly fighting with one another and constantly at war. But then a man who we call the Peacemaker came and joined us together in a peaceful union. And we've been joined together for about 1,000 years. Now today, many people call us by the name Iroquois or Iroquois because that's what the French people called us when they came across the ocean. But in our own languages, we call ourselves Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee. And that name was given to us by the peacemaker, the man that joined us together in that peaceful union. And in English, that word means the people, because of course we are people, the people who are building the long house or making the long house. And a long time ago, we did live in these long houses, but when the peacemaker gave us that name, it wasn't just about the building that we lived in, it was much more about how we were joining together. It's a very active verb. We have to work at peace. Peace doesn't just happen. So we are Haudenosaunee. We are people building the long house. Now we started with those original five tribes or nations. We use those words a little interchangeably, so both are okay. So we started with those original five, but today we have six because exactly 300 years ago in 1722, the Tuscarora came from North Carolina and asked if they could join into our union and they were adopted. And now we have six tribes or six nations that make up our Haudenosaunee union. And once we join together, we like to share everything. We lived in the same kind of house. We wear the same kinds of clothes. We use the same kinds of symbols, all sorts of things that we would share. Our food, like we were learning about, we shared also places to live, places to hunt and fish. But we also shared our stories. And so usually people will ask me at shows like this, are you telling Onondaga stories? No, I'm telling Haudenosaunee stories because we all share them. Sometimes one comes from one place or another, or somebody made it up, we can say where it comes from. But usually all Six Nations tell these stories. Now, the first story I wanna share with you today is one of the most important stories that we tell. It's the story of creation. How did the whole world get to be here? Where'd all this stuff come from? And of course, people all around the world tell stories like this, and of course we do too. So this is the story that the Haudenosaunee tell, and it's very similar to the story that the Lenape people that lived right here in Manahata, I think you guys pronounce it wrong, but Manahata, like the Lenape people called it, they told this very similar story. Little differences in theirs, but many things are quite similar. So this is the story of creation, how the whole world got to be here. Here we go. Well, we say this story happened a long, long time ago. And back at this time, all of the things that we can see in the world around us, 
things like trees, things like grass, all these buildings and cars, all the people. Well, none of these things were here. All that was here was water, covered the whole world in every direction as far as the eye could see. There was only water. Now, how the water got to be here, we, we don't know. We just accept that it was here. And in the water, there were some animals that lived, like fish and beaver, clam, all kinds of animals that like to live in the water. On top of the water, there were birds, duck, seagull, swan, all kinds of birds that like to live on the water. And up above these birds and animals, there was a blue dome that covered the whole sky. We call it the sky dome. And if we look up, we can still see it up above us right to this day. Well, the birds and animals down in the water, they didn't know it back then. But up above that dome, there is another world, the sky world or the spirit world. It's kind of the Haudenosaunee people's idea of heaven. And there are people that live up in that sky world. We call them sky people. And they look like and live like the Haudenosaunee did a long time ago. They lived in very long bark houses. They hunted for animals like the deer and the bear and the rabbit. They wore clothes made out of deer skin, just like I have on. They planted crops like corn and beans and squash, just like the Haudenosaunee a long time ago. But also up in that world back then, there was one tree that grew that was very important. It was called the Tree of Life. And this tree was so very important because out of it grew big white flowers. And out of the flowers whew, came light. So it was a very important tree. But one day, that great tree, oh, it started to shake. And it started to quake. And it started to tremble until, ah, boom. It fell over. And the roots whoa, pulled up out of the ground making a big hole. Well, the sky people heard about the great tree falling over, and they came out to see what had happened. One woman, her name was Yojichitsen. She wanted to see what was down in the hole that was created. And when she looked down, she saw that world of water down below. Well, sky people back then, they didn't know about the world of water below their feet. And Yojichi-sen wanted to see even more. So she got up close to the hole to have a look. She saw some clouds and some birds. She saw some water and some animals. She wanted to see even more. So she got right to the edge and poked her head down into the hole. But as she was looking around at everything down below, the ground on the edge of the hole started to crumble. She slipped, oh, and she fell. She fell down into the hole. She reached out and tried to grab onto the sides to stop herself from falling. But all that she came up with was two handfuls of dirt. She slid down into the hole. She started to fall towards the water down below. But as she was falling down through the air, some of the birds happened to look up. And they said, look, look, there is a woman falling from a hole in the sky dome coming down into our world. But they knew she couldn't come down that far and survive. So they decided to fly up to catch her in their wings to bring her down safely. The ducks and geese were the ones selected. So they flew up into the air and they spread out their wings. They made a nice bed for her. And she landed right on their backs. And then they turned and started to glide slowly towards the water bring her down safely. But as they were coming down through the air, one of the geese got a very smart idea in his mind. So he flew ahead of all of the rest, and he came down to the surface of the water. There he found a great snapping turtle. And he said, oh, great turtle, great turtle, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. We are bringing this sky woman who, who has come from a hole in the sky dome down into our world. But she is very heavy on our backs. 
I, I don't think she can float on the water like we do. But it doesn't look like she can swim like you or the fish. She needs a place to live in our world. May we put her onto your back so she stays up out of the water. Well, the snapping turtle, he thought about this and said, That would be a very good thing. You may put the sky woman onto my back. And that's usually what we call this woman right to this day. We call her sky woman. But those two animals named her. But the turtle is very wise and he said something else. He said, my back, my shell. It is very hard. It is very bumpy. I do not think the sky woman would be very comfortable. But at the bottom of the ocean, there is dirt and mud. If someone could go down and bring some up, they could put it onto my back. Then the sky woman has a good place to live. The animals all thought that this was a very good idea. So they tried to dive down to the bottom of that ocean. Beaver went down. Otter went down. The loon tucked her wings and went down. But it was too deep, and no one could make it. Until along came a little small animal maybe only this big, long skinny tail, little round black eyes. Today, some people don't like this animal. They think he's very dirty, but he's very important to the Haudenosaunee. His name, Muskrat. And Muskrat took in a big gulp of air. He kicked his arms and legs and he swam and swam and swam all the way to the bottom of the ocean. He grabbed a paw full of dirt and brought it back up to the surface. And there, the other animals took the dirt from his paw and smoothed it out on the back of the big turtle. And then those birds came down, and they put the sky woman onto that new patch of land. When she came down onto it, she started to walk. And then she started to dance, pushing one foot in front of the other. And as she danced, that piece of land started to grow. It grew, and it grew, and it grew to the place where she lived, and to the place where we all live right to this day, on what the Haudenosaunee people call Great Turtle Island, but what most people call Earth, or North America, this place where we live. When the Sky Woman opened up her hands, the dirt and the seeds she had grabbed up above came out and scattered all across the Turtle Island. And that's where we get all the grasses that we see growing in the world around us. But there was another seed in her hand at that time. It was the seed to the strawberry plant. And to this day, when the Haudenosaunee see that strawberry start to grow, we have a whole ceremony of thanksgiving. We say thank you to the strawberry for being the leader of all the berries, telling them all it's time to start growing, and also for being delicious. But when we see that strawberry, we also remember that it was a gift from the sky world. So the great turtle island was brand new. And now I will say to you, Donaho. When you hear me say Donaho in Onondaga language, that means I am done. Or those are my words. It's like the end. Donaho. That story is done. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, there are many, many, many important parts of this story, and many that we didn't even get to hear today. When we tell the whole story, it takes about three days to tell the whole thing. There's lots more about the sky world. There's lots more about the Great Turtle Island. So many, many parts to that story, and many things that are important to us to this day. Right at the very end of that story, we talk about our clans being put together, our families. We have nine different families. They all have animal symbols. I come from the turtle clan. It's the symbol for my family. The nine include the turtle, the bear, the wolf, the beaver, the deer, hawk, blue heron, snipe, and eel. And each person belongs to one. But a little while ago, I told you that I come from Onondaga. I pointed to my gestoa, my headdress, because of the two large eagle feathers that you can see on top. And today, it has become our tradition that men wear a certain number of feathers on their gestoa to indicate where they come from. 
So the two can tell you that I come from Onondaga. Some people believe you should wear one up and one down. Mm, we're still talking about that. But if my dad were here, I told you that he was Seneca, and he would have only one feather pointed straight up. But how can it be that if my dad is Seneca, and my dad is full-blooded, 100% Seneca, everybody in our family is Seneca, on that side of my family, for the past seven generations. If he is Seneca, how can I be on a Onondaga? What do you think? It's participatory. This is where you come in. What do you think? Because of my mother. That's exactly right. My mother was Onondaga and from the Turtle Clan. So that's what I am. It's our tradition among the Haudenosaunee to always say we come from the place and the family that our mother is from. Now I work in schools a lot, so usually I will ask them, why do we have that tradition? Why do we follow the mother side of the family? I'll give all of you a hint. I just spent about 15 minutes telling you the answer. <laughs> Why do we do that? Because of Sky. the Sky Woman. Who was first person on Earth, a man or a woman? A woman in the story that we just heard. And we didn't hear this part of the story today. When that woman came down onto the Turtle Island, she was about to have a baby. Did you have a baby boy or baby girl? Baby girl. Of course a baby girl. <laughs> so we say the first two people on earth were two women. When that young girl, usually called Lynx, it's a cat, grows up, she is courted by the West Wind, who is a male spirit, and she gives birth to two boys, twins. And the boys mess everything up. <laughs> uh. So if, like me, you came from a place that said women came first and boys messed things up, do you think you would think differently about women than if you came from a place that said a man came first and the woman was made from part of his body and she liked fruit, which I guess was bad, <laughs> and there's some snake in there? Maybe you know that story. Huh? Maybe you do things because of that story. If any, does anyone here have the same last name as their father or husband? Because of that story. That's why many people do it. Yeah. And other cultures and other traditions, they follow the father's side and have different traditions, but a lot of people follow that other story that I was just mentioning. It's pretty famous. It's written down in a pretty well-known book. So, yeah. <laughs> but our story is about the Sky Woman, and that's why we follow her side of the family. All right, so a lot of our traditions come from these stories, and we love, love, love to tell these stories. i got to tell you, there's one thing that's throwing me off. There's a guy in a purple shirt across the street telling stories also, and he keeps pointing at me, too, for some reason. So <laughs> I'm catching my own reflection. I keep, I keep seeing him. I'm like, what's that guy doing over there? So, yeah, <laughs> I like his necklace, too. That's what he wears. <laughs> All right, i got a fun story for you. Now, like I said, you might be part of the story, and some of the stories are participatory. So jump in at the appropriate time. This is one of those stories. Now, it is nice and sunny out. Beautiful day today, beautiful day yesterday, but nighttime is coming. And at nighttime... Maybe not so much around here, but where I'm from in upstate New York, you look up at the nighttime sky and you can see millions of stars. But did you all know that when the world was new, there were no stars up in the sky? And of course, the Haudenosaunee, we have a story about how all those stars got up there. So let's have this story about how the stars got into the nighttime sky. Here we go. Well, we say this story happened a long time ago, back when the great Turtle Island was new. And one day, which is our word for God or the Creator, Sacquiodizo came down onto the Turtle Island, and he was looking around at all of the beautiful things that were here. But as he was looking around at all these beautiful things, Elder Brother, the sun, was getting sleepy. And he was laying himself down, and he was going right... <sighs> 
to sleep. It got to be very dark. And when the creator looked around in all this darkness, he looked up at the nighttime sky and he saw nothing. There was nothing in the nighttime sky. <laughs> Grandmother Moon hadn't poked her head over the horizon yet. And everything across the sky was all black. But when the creator saw this, he thought, whoo! What a great place to paint a beautiful picture. So the next day, when the sun came up, the creator set about the Turtle Island looking for beautiful flowers. And he would pick those flowers. He would breathe his magic onto them. The flowers... started to glow, and he put them boop, into his pouch. And he went around all day. Boop, boop, picking these beautiful flowers. Boop, 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 into the pouch. And the bag was getting to be more and more and more full. But once again, elder brother, the sun, ah, was getting sleepy. And he laid down, and he went right to sleep. So now the creator thought, -hoo -hoo -hoo, now I'm ready to paint my beautiful picture. So he took that pouch. He reached inside and took out one of those glowing flowers. He reached up into the nighttime sky. <laughs> oh, it looks so beautiful. A new shining light in the sky. Oh, he liked it so much he took out another one. He reached up. Oh, it was beautiful. He kept doing it over and over. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Wow. But the creator wasn't the only one that saw the lights up in the nighttime sky. All the animals of the forest saw them also. And everybody came and gathered around the creator. And they watched as he took out one of those flowers. He put it up into the sky. And everybody said... Let's try again. He took out a glowing flower. Woo! He put it in the sky. Bloop, and everybody said, wow. Now we're getting it. Oh, everybody thought it was very beautiful. So the creator put another one up. Bloop, and everybody said, wow. Oh, over and over. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Everybody saying, wow. Oh, everybody loved the new stars up in the sky. But there was one animal that had come around that only thought about himself. And his name, Coyote. And that coyote saw the stars coming out of the bag. And he thought he wanted one just for himself. So he went running up to the creator and he said, Creator, please, can I have one star to put up into the sky? <laughs> and the creator looked at that coyote and said, Coyote, no! The stars are only for me. If I give one to you, I got to give one to everybody. Oh. All night, the creator was putting stars up into the sky. Bloop. Everybody was saying, wow. But the coyote, he just, please, please, creator, please, 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 please,
Coyote. No! Oh. After a while, though, the creator was getting tired. He had been picking flowers all day. He had been hanging stars all night. And now he needed to lay down to go to sleep. So he needed someone <laughs> to guard the bag of stars. So he had an idea for the coyote. Coyote, come over here, he said. And the coyote rushed for, oh, oh, can I have a star, can I have a star, can I have a star? And the creator said, coyote, I need to go to sleep. I need someone to guard the bag of stars. If you promise to watch it all night, if you promise to not open it, if you promise to not let anyone touch it, then I'll give you one star to put into the sky. said the coyote. So the creator gave him the bag of stars. And then the creator went and laid down and went right to sleep. Oh, all night long, that coyote, he was guarding that bag of stars. But sometimes he would get tired. And he set the bag down, and he started to fall asleep. And some of the nighttime animals thought about coming out to get the bag. But Coyote <laughs> would wake up just in time and scare everybody away. But after a while of guarding the bag, he looked off to the east. <gasps> oh, the sky was starting to get bright. The sun was getting ready to come up. And the coyote thought, if the sun comes up, I won't be able to see my star up in the sky. So he ran to the creator. He said, Creator, wake up! <laughs> but the creator was very tired and he. <laughs> stayed asleep. So Coyote decided that he would open the bag, that he would take out one star to put to the sky. So he set the bag down. He looked inside. Ooh, oh, M&Ms, all right, good, good, good. No, 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 that's a different story. That's a different story. Hey, that's for later. All right. He looked in that bag. Ooh, and saw lots of glowing flowers. Now Coyote didn't want one star. He wanted all the stars. He looked over at the sleeping creator. He closed up the bag. He turned towards the forest and whoosh, took off running ah, 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 as fast as he could. But everybody in the forest saw the coyote and what he was doing. So everybody yelled, Creator! Coyote is stealing the stars! And when everybody yelled, now the creator, oh, he started to wake up. He looked and saw coyote running away. Hey, coyote, get back here with my bag. He took a few giant creator steps through the forest. He reached out his hand. He grabbed a hold of that coyote. Yeah! And he gave a yank right on the coyote's tail. Ah! My tail, he yelled. And 
threw his hands up in the air. And the bag of stars, boom, crashed down onto the ground. When the bag hit the ground, it split open and the stars went everywhere. Oh, the creator was so upset. Oh, coyote, look what you did. Now the stars are everywhere. And he knew there were too many to rearrange, and they would have to stay where they were. Oh, Coyote was so upset, he ran away, and he hid. But to this day, at nighttime, often, Ungwahunwe, human beings, will come outside at night. They will look up at the nighttime sky. They'll see all of those beautiful stars, and they say, but Coyote comes out at night. He looks up at the sky and he says, Oh, look at all of my beautiful stars. <laughs> Donaho, that story is done. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. So you can see that a lot of our stories, like that creation story and like that story that I just told you, they explain things in the world around us. We have lots and lots and lots of stories that explain why the sun comes up, why the sun goes down, why winter comes, why spring comes, why the evergreen tree is always green, why the beaver has a flat tail, why the turtle has a cracked shell, why the turtle flies south for the winter, all different kinds of things. You never saw a turtle fly south for the winter? <laughs> They fly south every year. No. Okay, well, that's a whole other story. So, so, we have all these different kinds of stories that we tell. But in them, we also see lots of human behavior, like that coyote. And we learn about the proper way to behave and the proper way to interact with each other as people. In fact, in that creation story, we often talk about thinking with the good mind that good-minded twin who is born and makes all the things in the world around us, we're often reminded to think in the way that he taught us to think. And that's what a lot of these stories are designed to do as well, to remind us to think with the good mind. Don't be the coyote trying to steal all the stars, okay? So we see lots of that in our stories as well. All right, we're doing okay on time, so let me take a quick minute to describe the things that I'm wearing. Often people ask me about all the things that I have on. Everything that I'm wearing right now is traditional Haudenosaunee clothes. If you have seen pictures of other Native Americans, maybe at powwows or from different tribes, they might have on different styles of clothes because each tribe has their own style. Or some styles, which we see in lots of tribes, are maybe for particular dances. So if I was going to do a traditional dance versus a fancy dance, I would wear different things. If I was a man fancy dancer or a woman fancy dancer, I would wear different things. So each dance or tribe or culture might have their own regalia or traditional clothing. What I have on comes from the Haudenosaunee. So on my feet, I'll start at my feet, work my way up. I have on my moccasins. Now my moccasins, and we all today use the word moccasins, all Native Americans use the word moccasins, are a little bit in what we call the pucker toe style. Not exa exactly, they have that little vamp with the purple and the turtle on the front of them, if you can see, but they are a little bit more pucker toe than what we might see out west, which has a bigger, flatter, vamp on the top, okay? So my moccasins right now are made from deer skin. But earlier today, I was over at the Brooklyn Bridge Park and we were filming for an exhibit and I thought we were gonna be outside. So I put on my buffalo skin moccasins. I also have a pair of elk skin moccasins. And the buffalo and elk is a tougher skin. So when I'm outside, I need that extra protection for my feet when I'm doing all this. These are my inside moccasins <laughs> out of deer skin. So not quite as tough. So people would know which skins to use. And sometimes people will say to me, why did you get buffalo skin? The Haudenosaunee don't know anything about buffalo. Yes, we do. Because buffalo used to live right around here. A particular kind of buffalo called the woodlands buffalo. And they left this area about 400 years ago. 
but our people are very familiar with Woodlands Buffalo, not the big plains bison like we think out in North South Dakota, places like that. That's a different kind of animal, but the Woodlands Buffalo lived around here. So very familiar with Buffalo. All right, so got deer skin down there on my feet. Of course, turtles as the decoration. On my legs, I have on my leggings, which are also made from deer skin. Now, these are leggings, not pants. They're not connected. The way they stay up is when I put one leg on, there's a little strap over here. You probably saw it as I was telling the story. It's connected to a belt underneath, and that's what holds that leg up. So literally, I can put that leg on, hook that to the belt. I could walk around one-legged if I wanted, you know, another, until I put the other one on and hook that to the belt, okay? Then I also have on my deerskin breech cloth, my style of breech cloth, and most people wear this style today, modern style, apron style, two separate pieces hooked together with a belt underneath. Historically, breech cloth was only one piece up the front, over the belt, holding up your leggings, down in between your legs, so it kind of served like underwear a little bit. Then it would come back up over the belt and hang down and cover up your backside. The very first breech cloth I ever had made for myself was just like that. And I got up on stage and I started telling stories and I realized how uncomfortable it was to tell stories with a big piece of deer skin between your legs. I said, I need something else. So I got this more modern style. It kind of felt like I was wearing a diaper and I didn't really like it. So I switched over to this style, yeah. And of course, turtle to tell you what family I come from. Over here, my medicine pouch, also made from deer skin, has some decoration made out of porcupine quills. Now, the three colors, yellow, red, and black, are all dyed because porcupine quill only comes in white. Sometimes the tip is black, but never the whole thing. So the black has also been dyed. This is the natural color of the porcupine quill. But one thing about these three things, deer skin, deer skin, deer skin, they're all different colors. One of them is the most natural color of deer skin. Which one do you think it is? Moccasins, leggings, or bag? Which one is the natural color of deer skin? Everybody says bag. Moccasins. Or gestoa, because I got it up here as well. Deer skin is white. Deer hair is brown. So in the tanning process, preparing it to make clothes or anything else out of deer skin, it might change color a little bit towards this kind of tan color, like on my leggings here. So this is somewhat of a natural color, but when you first take it off of the deer, it is white. If you buy commercially produced deer skin, like my bag is made out of, they put brown color in because they want you to think it's the color of deer. But it's not. <laughs> deer hair is brown. You scrape off all that hair, and it's pure white. <laughs> yeah? All right. So they are all deer skin, but they have all been produced in slightly different ways. That's why there's the different colors. And you wear them a long time. They get darker because they get dirty. So <laughs> that's the other thing. Yep. All right. Over here, I have on my wampum belt. Now, wampum is very important to the Haudenosaunee and other native peoples, especially from this area. One of the most important trade items here on the island of Manahata was wampum. Some people erroneously think that wampum was a form of money. That's not true, but it was a trade item. People traded it all the time. It never had a specific or inherent value, like that green paper we carry in our purses or wallets, okay? So, or I was just in Europe. Coins, all coin money. Oh my God, it drives me crazy. I'm like, what is this, is this a quarter? I don't know what this is. No, it's five euros. I'm like, that's fine, okay, I'll put that in my pocket, yeah. So, oh, it drives me crazy, coin money. But Wampum was not like that. It didn't have a specific value. To one person, 10 beads might be one fur that they'd trade. To another person, it might be 20 beads to trade for the same kind of fur. Each person had a different value to it. It was very important to the Haudenosaunee, and it does come from this area right around here, all along the Atlantic coast, definitely here in the New York Sound kind of area. Lots of quahog clams. And wampum, true wampum, is made from that one specific clam, the quahog. Quahog comes in only two colors, purple and white, which is why <laughs> I have my clothes made in those colors. 
You'll see when the dancers come up here, they got all different color clothes on. Each person decides what color, what style they want for themselves. I have chosen to match with the wampum. Okay, that's just my personal choice. Yep. So the things I have below my waist are all natural materials, things you would have seen Native Americans using hundreds of years ago before people came across the ocean. But when people came from Holland, the Dutch people that settled here, from France, the French people that settled up in Quebec and, and what we now call Canada, the English people who came a little bit later and pushed the Dutch people out a little bit, they brought all kinds of new stuff with them. Things like wool, like my sash. Wool, of course, comes from sheep. Sheep are not indigenous to North America. Neither are cows or horses or chickens or pigs or goats. All of those animals were imported. They brought those ones on purpose. Things like honeybees and rats are brought by accident. Those weren't here either. So my wool sash was something that the Haudenosaunee had to learn about, the things that we can get from those farm animals. So this was a new material, a new technology. My ribbon shirt is made from cotton. Cotton is indigenous to North America, but Native American people didn't know how to weave the fibers together to make cloth. We know how to weave other things, basket over here that we saw earlier, and other uh, reeds and things to make mats or rushes and different cordage that we could make by weaving, but we didn't know how to weave fibers like this. So there was some weaving, but not in this way. The ribbons are made out of silk, of course, comes from a completely different part of the world. So this was new technology and new material to us as well. I do have on some metal decoration also, and the metal, any kind of metal, chair, your car keys, whatever it might be, all those things were introduced to the Haudenosaunee. We didn't know how to heat up metal and pound it into shape or to pour it into shape. That's the two ways we make things out of metal. Okay, So we didn't know how to do that. So this was new technology to us as well. Here, my glass beads that I have on. And of course, glass was something that we didn't know how to make either. So this was a new idea to us. But once we got all of these things, we incorporated them into who we are as Haudenosaunee people. We started to use them all the time. So all these things are part of our identity today. Around my neck, I have on my choker. My choker is a little bit of a combination. We can see some glass beads on there, but we also see deer bones. That's what all these are made from, deer bones, bones, yeah. And bones and shells, teeth or claws, those are things we used as decorations before we had this. And it's all held together with some cow leather. Remember, cows were new here also. So this is kind of a combination of new and old. On top of my head, I have on my gustoa. This is today a traditional form of headdress for the Haudenosaunee. We have been wearing these for over 300 years. Mine is a little bit different than some people's. A lot of people wear natural colored things. A lot of people don't cover it with deer skin like mine is. I just don't like my hair sticking out, that's all. So I cover up mine with deer skin. I have turkey and goose feathers. That's the white ones. And then, like I said, the two big eagle feathers tell you where I come from. So this is a traditional Haudenosaunee man's headdress. Man, only men wear this. Women don't wear this, only for men. So everything that I have on was made by somebody from the Haudenosaunee. And this is our traditional form of clothing today. All right, we got time for one more story? We're okay? One more, okay. We'll have kind of a short one here. I got time for one more story before they kick me off the stage. So let's have one more really, really fun one. And this story, since we mentioned it already, is going to be about Hatnawa. And this is a good time of year to tell it because if you look up in the sky, what are the birds getting ready to do? migrate. They're getting ready to fly south for the winter. And one young lady didn't believe that turtle fly south for the winter also. You know that turtle fly south, right? You don't believe it? He doesn't believe it either. But every year, turtle fly south. And the Haudenosaunee have a story to prove it. So let's have this story about the turtle who flew south for the winter. Here we go.
Well, this story happened a long, long time ago, back when the great Turtle Island was new. And back at this time, there was a beautiful pond of water. And all around it were wonderful trees and grass and moss and rocks out in the sun. And one little Hatnua turtle, in our language, lived in that pond. Woo! Turtle loved his pond and all the wonderful things around it. But one day when he was sunning himself on one of those rocks, a whole big flock of geese came flying through the air and they <laughs> landed on his pond. And geese love to talk to one another. So all the turtle heard was <laughs> and the noise was driving him crazy. So he swam out into the pond and he said, what are all of you geese talking about? And one of the geese looked at him and said, oh, Mr. Turtle, we're getting ready to fly south for the winter. We have to teach our young ones how to do it so that we can make it all the way to the south. Turtle heard this. South? What is this south? I never heard of it before. And the goose said, oh, south is a wonderful, magnificent kind of place. In the south, it is warm all winter. And in the south, there's lots to eat all the time. And in the south, the leaves stay green on the trees all year. And Turtle thought, oh, wow, that sounds great. Because the thing that I don't like about my pond is winter. In the winter, oh, it gets so cold. And there's ice all over my pond. And the leaves fall off the trees. And there's hardly anything to eat. And the goose said, oh, in the south, it's much nicer than that. So Turtle had a good idea. He said, hey, can I fly south with all of you? And the goose said, Turtle, how are you going to fly south? I'm going to practice. That's what I'm going to do, said the turtle. So over the next few days, the geese would take off and fly up into the air. They would form that big V up in the sky, and they showed their little ones how to fly. And each day, turtle would practice also. He would swim across that pond as fast as he could. He would jump in the air ah, and sink down to the bottom. But each day, he was getting a little higher and higher and higher. Well, one morning, Turtle was waking up in his den, and he heard <laughs> all the geese were talking again. And he came out and said, what are you geese talking about now? And one of them said, Turtle, today is the day. It's time fly south. But the turtle said, ah, I'm not ready. I, I can't fly yet. You're going to leave me behind. But the geese felt bad for that turtle. They had seen him practicing day after day. So they said, turtle, we'll tell you what. What if we pick up a stick and we'll fly low over the pond? You reach out that long, beautiful neck. You clamp down onto that stick with those powerful jaws, and we'll carry you up into the sky. And then you can fly south. Oh, Turtle was so happy. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I can do it, he said. 
So all the geese lifted off into the air and started to fly. Two of them came down and picked up a stick. They flew low over the pond. And Turtle, he was swimming as fast as he could. When they went over his head, he reached out that long, beautiful neck. He opened up his jaws and he clamped down right onto that stick and held on as hard as he could. And the geese carried him up into the sky. We did it, thought the turtle. We're going to fly south. And the geese just kept on flying. Well, all day long, the geese were flapping those wings, and they were flying farther and farther and farther towards the south. And they had been going for hours. But turtle was starting to get tired. And he happened to look down, and he saw a beautiful pond. And just then, bloop, he saw some minnows jumping. Ooh, there was lots of food, just like in the south. He looked at the trees around the pond, and their needles were all green. And it didn't look like they were going to fall from the tree, just like in the south. And then he saw some beautiful rocks, and he felt the warmth of the sun. And he thought, we did it! We flew to the south! We made it! But the geese just kept on flying. It didn't seem like they were going to stop. And Turtle thought, oh, maybe they don't see it. I better let them know. So he said to them, hey, look down. We made it to the south. But because he had that stick in his mouth, it sounded like, <laughs> and the geese were flying. And the turtle, what, what are you, be quiet back there. We're trying to fly south. Oh, that turtle, he thought for sure they didn't understand. So he tried to say it louder. <laughs> And the turtle, hush up back there. We're trying to fly south. So Turtle knew he had to tell them to look down. So he opened up his mouth and said, hey, look down. It started to fall through the air. Because as soon as he opened his mouth, he let go of that stick. And he started to fly through the air, aiming right towards that pond. When he came down to it, boom, he skipped off the water, boom, he skipped again, boom, all the way across the pond. Until finally, boop, he buried himself in the mud on the far side of the pond. He nestled himself right into that mud and he thought, ooh, it's nice and warm here in the south. Just then a little grub went in front of him. He had something to eat. Ooh, lots to eat in the south. He poked his head up over the mud and he saw all the green needles on the trees and thought, Ooh, it's green, just like in the south. I did it. I flew south for the winter. But he was so tired from that long trip that he put his head down and he went <laughs> right to sleep. Oh, he was so tired from flying south, he slept all winter long. <laughs> and now whenever Turtle sees the leaves start to fall, he feels the chill in the air. He swims across his pond as fast as he can. He jumps in the air and buries himself in the mud. And all winter he dreams about the time that he flew south. <laughs> Don, I hope that story is done. <laughs> now, do you believe me that turtle flies south for the winter? <laughs>
<laughs> Didn't say how far south he went. I just said he went south, yeah. All right. Hey, that's all the time we have for stories uh, this afternoon. I want to say thank you to everybody for coming out. I want to say thank you for the invitation to come. Be sure to learn more about the organization. There's some information out in the lobby. We do have a terrible, terrible show coming up for you next. <laughs> My very good friend Chris Thomas is going to be up here, and actually he's going to do some fantastic Haudenosaunee social dances for you, and you might even have the chance to come up and dance with him and participate. If you like the stories that I tell, I do have a Facebook page. It is called Talking Turtle Stories. Talking Turtle Stories. And if you follow that page, you don't need to friend, just follow, you get Native American stories. I write my stories online. I illustrate with Native American artwork. All you get on my page is great Native American stories. So if you'd like Talking Turtle Stories, please do follow that page. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great afternoon. All right, enjoy the dancing. <laughs>